Well, God bless you all. This is part five in our Bible study in the book of Philippians. Thank you uh, for your prayers uh, as you have kept my wife Judy and me in prayer. Uh, we are continuing to pray for you day by day by day, praying that the good Lord will answer your prayers. Uh, thank you for all the prayer requests that you've sent to us. You continue to send them and we continue to pray day by day that your prayers will be answered as we pray with you and we pray for you. And we thank you so much for praying for us, keeping us in prayer. Uh, pray for our health and strength, please that the Lord will help us to carry on and that Lord, the good Lord will work everything out uh, and uh, make everything possible for us to carry on. Uh, we thank you uh, for your love and your concern for us. And uh, we thank you for your support. We thank you so much for your encouragement. And uh, we're just so thankful uh, that we can all pray one for another. And that's what this channel is all about. And, uh, this Bible study uh, today, I hope will be a blessing to you, and I, I hope you'll pray for it. Pray for our Bible study that uh, God will greatly use this. We want to be winning that lost soul to Christ. We want to upbuild the body of Christ. We want to glorify our God and exalt the name of Jesus. That's our purpose. We've been talking about how the Apostle Paul, who is in prison as he's writing his letter to the Philippians, He's in prison, but he talks about how that he rejoices. Live or die uh, to this world, he is in Christ. And uh, so today what I want to share with you is a story that many of you have probably heard. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have not. And so uh, for those of you that are familiar with the story of the Ten Boom family, uh, specifically Corey Tim Boom and her sister Betsy Tim Boom and uh, their sister Nolly and uh, brother Willem and father and uh, mother and uh, entire family. During World War II, when uh, the Nazis were persecuting the Jews, the Tim Boom family lived in Holland, in the Netherlands. And uh, so they were uh, Dutch people that uh, came to the aid of many of the Jewish people that were being persecuted. They came to the aid of many of the, the Dutch resistance workers, and uh, they uh, provided a hiding place for uh, many people during those terrible, terrible years of World War II in Europe, when Hitler had uh, taken over many countries, including the Netherlands, uh, and he was persecuting the Jews. Uh, they were instrumental in saving many lives. And I want to talk a little bit about their uh, story in this video because I feel that it is such an example to us. And it so lives out what Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes about here uh, in, the, in his letter to the Philippians. Uh, this is God's inspired word that uh, God inspired Paul to write down the Word of God, uh, and it is to the church in, Phil in uh, Philippi, and it is to us today. It is the Word of God for all generations. It's the Word of God for us today. Corey Ten Boom, as I said, was a Dutch Christian. She worked with her watchmaker father. Her father was a watchmaker in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, her father's name was Casper Ten Boom. Uh, she had uh, two sisters, Nolly and Betsy, and she had a brother named Willem. Uh, and uh, other, her and other family members, as I said, helped many Jews escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust in World War II by hiding them in a secret place in their home. Uh, she believed that her actions were in obedience to God, in service to God, to help uh, persecuted people and to stand against Adolf Hitler, uh, definitely a forerunner of uh, the Antichrist, a man who wanted to uh, dominate the world, take over the world, a man who was all about himself at a time when uh, Germany was all about this cult worship of uh, a man, Adolf Hitler. Corey wrote a book 
uh, her of, of the story, the whole story, and it was called The Hiding Place. Uh, it's a biography that recounts the entire story of her family's efforts to help others and how she found Christ and how she shared her hope in Christ uh, while she was imprisoned at the concentration camp. Uh, if any of you, they made a movie about this book, The Hiding Place. If any of you haven't seen the movie, uh, it is here on YouTube. Uh, and I will uh, put a link up right here, right now. Uh, and you can uh, click on that link and uh, you can watch that entire movie. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting story. Uh, but uh, Corey was born to a working class family in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, Corey, as I said, had three older siblings, Betsy, Willem, and Nolly. Her father was a jeweler and a watchmaker, and uh, the Ten Boom family lived above Casper's uh, watch shop. Uh, his watch making shop and jewelry shop was in the lower floor, and there they lived on the upper floor above uh, the shop, which was not uncommon in those days. And Corey herself trained to be a watchmaker. And in 1922, Corey uh, Ten Boom became the first woman to ever be licensed as a watchmaker in, uh, in the Netherlands. So she was the first female watchmaker in Holland. And uh, in her early life as a watchmaker, she established a Christian youth club for teenage girls, providing classes uh, in the performing arts, in sewing and handicrafts, as well as providing Christian fellowship and Christian teaching. Uh, the Ten Boom family belonged to the Dutch Reformed Church. Their Christian faith inspired them to give shelter and food and help of every kind to those who were in need. In May of 1940, Hitler's German army invaded the Netherlands and uh, conquered uh, Holland. They put an end to Corey's uh, Youth Club for Girls. And in May of 1942, a woman came to the Ten Booms home carrying a suitcase and uh, told them that she was a Jew and that her husband had been arrested several months earlier and her son had gone into hiding and that the German authorities had recently visited her at her house and she was afraid to go back home. And she had heard that the Ten Boom family had previously helped their Jewish neighbors. And she asked if they would help her too. So Casper, he readily agreed that she could stay with them. And uh, even though the police headquarters was only a half a block away from their house, from then on, the home of the Ten Boom family uh, became a refuge for both Jews and for members of the Dutch resistance movement. Uh, an architect was sent by the Dutch resistance movement. Uh, he was sent to the Ten Boom Hall to build a secret room, uh, and it was adjacent to Corey's bedroom. Uh, the hiding place, it was called, was behind a false wall. Uh, and it would hold uh, up to six people at a time. Uh, a ventilation system was installed for the occupants of the room. A buzzer could be heard in the house to warn the refugees uh, to get into the room as quickly as possible uh, when there were security sweeps throughout the neighborhood. They had room, but wartime shortages meant that food was scarce. Every non-Jewish Dutch person had received a ration card, but the Jewish people had not. And the requirement for obtaining weekly uh, food, food coupons was dependent upon that ration card. And through her charitable work, Corey knew many people, including a civil servant who was in charge of the local ration card office. She went to his house one night and when he asked how many ration cards she needed, she opened her mouth to say five, but the number that came out of her mouth instead was 100. To her astonishment, uh, totally unexpectedly, 
Her mouth opened up to say five and out came the words 100. He gave them to her. He gave them one, he gave 100 ration cards to Corey, uh, knowing that uh, Corey was helping those in need. And she provided ration cards then to every Jew that she met. Corey soon became part of the Dutch Underground Resistance Network and she oversaw a network uh, smuggling Jews to other safe places. All in all, it is estimated that around 800 Jews were saved by the efforts of Corey Ten Boom and her family. Uh, but on the 28th of February, 1944, a Dutch informant told the Nazis uh, what the Ten Boom family was doing and the Nazis arrested the entire Ten Boom family. They were sent to Scheveningen prison after resistance materials and extra ration cards were found at their home. Nolly and Willem, uh, two of uh, Corey and Betsy's siblings, they were released soon after. The group of six people that were hidden at that time by the Ten Booms who were uh, both Jewish people and resistance workers uh, they remained undiscovered. Uh, and though the house was under constant surveillance after the family's arrest, some local police officers who were secretly members of the Dutch resistance coordinated uh, the refugees' escape. So all six that were in the building at the time of the arrest of the Ten Boom family, all of them made an escape and got away. Now the Gestapo soon released many of the people that had been captured that day. But Corey and Betsy and their father Casper were kept in prison and Casper died 10 days later. Corey was initially held in solitary confinement, but after three months she was taken to her first hearing and Corey and Betsy were eventually sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, a women's labor camp in Germany. And there, through hard labor and uh, through much struggle, they managed to hold worship services after their hard day of work by using a Bible that they had managed to uh, get smuggled in. And through their witnessing and through living God's love, Corey and Betsy won many of the prisoners there to Christ. Many of the people came to Christ, Jewish and Gentile. But Betsy's health deteriorated as they worked the long, hard uh, hours in the labor camp. Uh, Betsy then died on the 16th of December, 1944. Uh, before she died, she said to her sister, Corey, she said, Corey, there is no pit that is so deep that God is not deeper still. And then Betsy left this old world and went to her reward. Twelve days later, Corey Ten Boom was released from prison. And afterwards, she found out that her release was because of a clerical error. And that a week later, all of the women in her age group had been sent to the gas chambers. And so, by a miracle, Corey got out of that uh, concentration camp in time uh, to live on. And Corey returned back home and she still opened her doors even then to those who were still hiding in fear of execution. And then the war came to an end and Corey set up her home as a rehabilitation center for concentration camp survivors and also as a shelter for the hated Dutch who had collaborated with the Germans during the occupation. So uh, she gave aid and comfort even to those that were hated because they had collaborated with the Nazis. She showed the love of Christ to everybody. Willem Ten Boom, her brother, died in 1945 of a disease that he caught while he was in prison. Uh, Nolly Ten Boom, her oldest sister, lived until 1953 and died of natural causes. Uh, but Corey went on to live, uh, after Nolly died, Corey went on to live another 30 years 
Corey went on to travel the world as a public speaker, sharing her story uh, in more than 60 countries. She wrote many books, and uh, one was titled Tramp for the Lord, uh, with each chapter telling a different story about her travels and how she shared the gospel message to people in Africa and Europe and the Americas and Asia and the USSR and Cuba and China. Uh, and then Corey wrote the story of her family in her best-selling book, The Hiding Place, as I've already mentioned, uh, which was made into a movie. And then Corey died on her 91st birthday uh, in 1983. And so uh, Corey lived a long life after her imprisonment and was a witness to people all over the world. I've often talked in my videos about how that in these last days, uh, we know that the Bible says that persecution is coming to the church. Uh, the Antichrist uh, is rising. Uh, we know that uh, the false prophet is coming. And the Bible is very clear that in the last days there will be persecution of God's people. But I've often mentioned how the Bible also makes it clear that it, the story won't be the same for everybody. There will be different things happening to different people. Uh, some of us, uh, the Bible is clear, some of us will lay down our lives and uh, be martyred. Uh, and, and many will be beheaded, the Bible says, in the last days. And give their life uh, for Christ. And uh, many will be put in prison. The Bible is clear about that. And, uh, but the Bible is also clear that there will be many that will still be on the earth when Jesus returns. The Bible says that at the second coming of Jesus, at the gathering of the saints, the dead in Christ shall rise first and be caught up to meet the Lord. And then those that are still alive will be changed and uh, in the twinkling of an eye be caught up to meet the Lord uh, in the air. And uh, there they will be, all of the saints will be mounted on white horses and uh, be a part of the armies of heaven as Jesus comes and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. And so uh, these things are foretold in the Bible. But uh, I've made that point before that the Bible is very clear that uh, it, the story won't be the same for everybody. Uh, everybody's not going to be martyred. And everybody's not going to remain until the second coming. And everybody's not going to be put in prison, but some will and some won't. Uh, it's going to be a different story for different people. And that's that's what I think that we see in the, the story of the Ten Boom family. You know, Betsy, uh, she died in prison. Uh, she was martyred. She was worked to death. Uh, Corey, on the other hand, survived and uh, went on to give her testimony for 30 years after uh, her older sister, Nolly, died. Uh, Nolly, on the other hand, uh, was not kept in prison very long at all, and uh, she, but she then just lived a short time and died of natural causes. So different things will happen to different people in this old world, and uh, that's the way it's going to be here in these end times, and I've talked about that, and I think that's important for us to remember that. None of us knows for sure. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, I'm, I could die today. The Lord could call me home today. Uh, or he could uh, see to it that I live on and uh, maybe someday I'll be martyred. Or maybe someday I'll live on and be here at the second coming of Jesus. I mean, we just don't know. Just trust in the Lord, come what may. Let's look at uh, verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, what Paul is saying here is, for I know that through your prayers and with the help that is given by the Spirit of Jesus, by the Spirit of God, uh, I know that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that he has faith that no matter what, uh, things are going to work out in the end. Uh, it will end well. The, the story ends well, as we, as we know in reading the Bible. The story ends well. And uh, so whatever happens, uh, it's going to work out well. And the prayers of the saints are part of that. Uh, the prayers, he says here, uh, he says, through your prayers, uh, because of your prayers, 
He's saying that, in other words, your prayers are instrumental. Your prayers are part of it. So always, God says, pray for one another. Be a praying person, a praying saint of God, a praying child of God, because your prayers are part of uh, God's plan. It's part of what God is doing. Uh, your, your prayers are instrumental in working things out for the good. God answers prayer. And he cares about our prayers. He wants us to pray. And he wants us to be a praying people. And uh, someone has once said that God doesn't do anything without first moving his people to pray about it. <laughs> and that's, and, you know, I think that's true. Uh, when God is going to do whatever he's going to do, uh, first he moves his people to pray about it. And uh, as we pray and pray and pray, that's a part of it that pleases God that his people are a part of what God is doing because we are praying and praying for God's will to be done. We are praying for good things to happen and God wants to do good things, but he wants us to be a part of it in prayer. Whenever we pray for others, we need to always remember that whatever is good for others is good for us. Whatever is good for us is good for others in Christ because God works all things together for the good for those who love him. So if I'm praying for good things to happen for others, uh, that involves me, and it, it's good for me too. Uh, and when others pray for me and uh, good things come, uh, that's good for those that prayed as well as me because uh, every we're all intertwined. We're part of the family of God, and we're all working together in Christ. And uh, we're all a part of God's will and God's plan. And prayer is an instrumental in that. And so uh, let's read then verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. What we're hearing the Apostle Paul say is that he eagerly expects and he hopes that he will in no way be ashamed, but that he will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in his body, whether by his life or by his death. In other words, uh, live or die, life or death, uh, Christ will be exalted because God's grace is sufficient and God will supply the courage that we need to face the future. Isn't it wonderful to know that God made that promise, that his grace is sufficient, that he will give us the courage to face tomorrow, uh, no matter what happens. Uh, it's so easy for us to think, oh no, how will I ever face it? How will I ever live in these last days? How will I ever get through it? How will I ever be brave enough? You will be brave enough because you will have faith in God and trust in God. God will supply you with all that you need, all the courage that you need. The Bible says that when you stand before those that put you on trial, don't even think about the words you're going to say ahead of time, because at that time, the Bible says God will give you the words to say. God will supply you with all that you need, all the strength and courage that you need day by day by day as we live out these final days uh, toward the second coming of Jesus. Uh, and then uh, let's read verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, that's a, a saying that we hear from the Bible a lot. Uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, what Paul is saying here is all is well. In other words, all is well. That, that just sums it up in a nutshell. All is well with my soul. I love that song, all is well with my soul. Uh, to live is Christ. Uh, to live in this world, I have God. I have Christ. I have Jesus living in my heart. Uh, I have the spirit of Christ within. Uh, to live is to be in Christ. And uh, to know that God's grace is sufficient every day. Uh, and to die is gain. When I leave this old world, uh, I'm only going to a better, far better place than this old world. Uh, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with God forever. I'm going to be with my Lord Jesus 
forever and ever. And uh, we will forever and ever uh, praise him and exalt him and worship him and serve him in heaven forever and ever. The Bible says that uh, the, his people will serve him in heaven. So we will be God's servants God, and worshiping God, rejoicing in God. Our reward is there. The Bible says that while we're living in this old world, we're laying up treasures in heaven as Christians. Every good deed we do will be remembered and, and rewarded forever in heaven. Uh, so to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, let's read verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I would choose, I do not know. So in other words, what Paul is saying here is, if I am to go on living in the body, uh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. <laughs> in other words, he's saying, you know, if I had my choice, uh, of course, we're in the will of God and it's up to God. And Paul he knows that, but he's saying, if it were up to me, he said, I don't know what I would choose. He said, because uh, uh, which would be better? Uh, living in this body means fruitful labor. Living in this body means that uh, I'm going to go on uh, doing God's work. I'm going to go on uh, living for the Lord. I'm going to go on uh, having fruitful labor. And uh, he said, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. Let's read verse 23 then. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. In other words, he's saying, you know, if it was up to me, he said, uh, he said, it's, it's a difficult, uh, it would be a difficult choice to make. He said, because uh, I want so much to go home. Uh, and many of you have sent me comments saying, you know, you just long for the day with the second coming of Jesus. And I feel the same way. Oh, how I long to go home. How I long to see uh, the end of this old world and all its troubles and sorrows. Uh, and uh, to depart and be with Jesus is far better, of course, than anything that we could ever hope for in this world. It's infinitely uh, better than anything on planet Earth. Uh, to go home and be with God, that is our heart's desire, and it should be. It should be our heart's desire. We're longing for heaven. We're longing for our heavenly home. We're longing to be face to face with our God and to be in the presence of the Lord face to face forever and ever. Oh, what a day that will be. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. So in other words, what Paul is saying here is, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. In other words, he's saying, uh, I'm here for a purpose. As long as I live in this old world, uh, there's a reason. And uh, it is so that I can be a part of the body of Christ um, and uh to be a member of the body of Christ, and uh, each member has a function. And so uh, God has a function for you. As long as you're in this old world, as long as your days uh, are, are on earth, uh, God has a reason, and God has a function for you. God has made you a member of his body, and you have a purpose. You need to be praying. You need to be praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to be telling people about Jesus at, at any opportunity that you have. You may say, well, I don't have many opportunities. Well, you have every opportunity to be praying. You can get on your knees and pray right now. Uh, you may say, well, I can't even get on my knees. Uh, well, if you can't even get on your knees, you can, you can pray uh, from your sick bed or you can pray from uh, the chair that you sit in. But wherever you are, you can bow your head and you can bow your heart. You can have uh, you can humble yourself before God and pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray and pray and pray. And then whatever opportunity you have, whether it's to speak to a caregiver or whether it's to speak to someone uh, that uh, passes by, uh, you, can, you can let people know that you love Jesus. Uh, and, you know, when I say witness to people, I'm not saying take a Bible and, and bang somebody over the head with it. But what I mean is, let people know that you love Jesus and give them 
an answer for the for uh, why you have the hope that you have within you. Let them know. Uh, say, you know, I am saved. Tell them about it. Tell people about how God saved you, a sinner, and uh, brought you into the family of God and made you it, made you a saint, made a sinner into a saint. Uh, tell tell it to people and share that with people, and uh, let let it be known as far and wide as you are possibly able to do. Let people know that you love God, that you love Jesus, that Jesus is your Savior, and uh, that you you love the Lord, and you're living for the Lord, and that's what it's all about. And your hope is in heaven, and you're looking forward to the days to come, because you know that uh, you have a future in Christ. And so in other words, what Paul is saying here is, convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Uh, he's saying that, in other words, uh, I believe that it's God's will for me to carry on. Uh, you know, I've said that to you uh, many times on this channel. Uh, for now, God has put me where I am doing what I'm doing. And uh, it's the same with you, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Uh, God has a purpose for you. And God has a reason for why you're still in this old world. He wants you to be his minister to others. He wants you to be a witness to others. He wants you to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we press on. That's what our calling is. And then uh, the final verse we're looking at in our Bible study today. Uh, let's read verse 26. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. In other words, joy is the result. Joy is the result. Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, we're going, everything is well with our soul. Everything is well with our future. Everything is well, whether we uh, continue to live on in this world or whether we die, whether we go on to heaven, because uh, we will never die. We'll never perish. Uh, we will live forever and ever in heaven. So uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is to move on uh, and, be, and graduate <laughs> to heaven and uh, live forever in heaven. And so all is well. And joy is the result. Uh, as I said, uh, Betsy uh, said to her sister, Corey, said, There is no uh, pit that is so deep that God is not deeper still. I mean, think about that, folks. Uh, whatever uh, you're concerned about today, Whatever pit you feel uh, you may be in at, at, in times in your life, believe me, there have been times in my life when I felt like I was down in a dark hole. Uh, I think most of us at some time or another in our life have felt that. And uh, I can tell you that these words are true. No matter how deep the hole, uh, God is deeper. God is deeper. God's love, God's presence, God's grace is deeper than any dark hole that you have uh, fallen into. And so let God lift you out of that dark hole. Let God lift you out of that uh, pit because God is faithful. 